Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another Geopolitical Futures podcast. I'm Jacob Shapiro. I am joined by a special guest today. With me on my right here in sunny Austin, Texas, is Dario Fabri. He's the senior analyst at Limes Geopolitical Magazine. How's it going, Dario? It's going good. Thank you, Jacob, for having me. It's a pleasure. Um, some of our listeners might remember that we had a podcast uh, a couple weeks ago, maybe a month ago. A month ago, yeah. Yes, where uh, George Friedman spoke with Lucio. So George is the head of Geopolitical Futures, and Lucio is the head of Limes. We are the right hand, the right hand men behind the men who lead these companies. <laughs> please, so we, <laughs> please don't don't tell Lucio. On that. <laughs> so we thought we'd have a conversation on the side and see if we can't talk about some things. And I thought the first thing to talk about with Dario, uh, Dario is uniquely positioned because he covers America for Limes. So I thought I might ask Dario. Let's get a completely different perspective from Italy's point of view. What just happened at the G7? How do you think about it? Well, the G7 was the first occasion for our new government to get out there and try to make France or Italy uh, understand what the world around is and where, where it's going. Let's, let's try to understand what Italy has been trying to pursue as its own strategy at this point, something that goes strictly beyond any political ideologies or any ideology whatsoever that you might think. Italy uh, nowadays needs Germany to redistribute wealth around the Euro, the Eurozone at this point. Of course, we're a part of the Eurozone. Germany is an exporting country, and uh, it exports much um, to Italy and even to other, of course, other countries around the Eurozone. Italy would like for Germany to redistribute that wealth. Germany does not want to do that. From a German uh, point of view, from a German perspective, Germans would say, of course, you have our currency. Of course, we share the currency, not because it's it's the German currency, but we share the same currency. But because of that, of course, the Germans would admit they've been exporting much, much more than they would if you didn't have that currency. But because of that currency, we're paying less interest rates on our, on our national debt. Italy would say that it, it's, it's more important for Germany to export that much than for us to pay less interest on that. To do, to do so, we were going to face... Uh, financial pressure coming from Germany onto the markets, of course, uh, going forward. So Italy would like, I don't know, that, that could be a pipe dream at this point, but would like for the U.S. to kind of guarantee for Italy to some extent before those very those very financial markets. So the previous government and these government, Italy's governments, I mean, they've been pursuing the same strategy, exactly the same strategy. But if you look at, at Italy's media, you will read that things are really different. Just because the U.S. administration changed, Italy's government changed, uh, what I mean is Italy's strategy is just what I said. It doesn't matter the ideology. Back then, our previous government, France's government, and even Gentiloni's government, they were trying to pursue the same strategy by banking on the previous U.S. administration. And it was not coincidental. Uh, now we have the previous administration, and Italy's new government has been banking on this new administration for the, the very same reason to go vis-a-vis -vis Germany, to fight for Germany to redistribute wealth inside the Eurozone, even to rethink the whole construction, and to have our, our, our back, uh, to have the U.S. on, on, our, on our side at this point, uh, no matter the ideology. So to, uh, to answer your question, uh, at EG7, Italy's government was just, was just trying to do that, to convince Trump that Italy's government has changed, that now we'd like for him to be in our, uh, at our side against Germany. What doesn't change from, from our own perspective is the collision course that the U.S. and Germany are on, and just, uh, that's just something that Italy's been trying to, to exploit it at its own benefit, starting from, from, from the past few years going forward, and uh, just what we saw at the last G7. Well, and I think this is one area where we probably agree very much, which is that, as you said, the system is basically only working for Germany. Uh, Germany has gotten fabulously wealthy from exporting all around the world, and it has been keeping those reserves inside of Germany because Germany doesn't want to bail out Greece, and it doesn't want to bail out Italy, and it doesn't want to be responsible for keeping all these groups together. At the same time, Germany needs to have access to this free trade zone so that it continue exporting and building up its economy. So it puts Germany in this interesting position where, on the one hand, they need to keep people happy. They need to keep people having faith in the Eurozone and doing all the things that Brussels says. And at the same time, they are not willing necessarily to give up those parts of its own sovereignty that they would have to give up to keep the Eurozone together. And I think maybe you get a sense of this in terms of we've even seen France and Germany disagreeing about what to do about the Eurozone. 
French, with their recent proposals, want to make huge changes. And Angela Merkel just came out a few weeks ago and said, well, we don't want such big changes. Why can't we just keep everything within each individual nation state itself? We had lunch before we did this podcast, and you were telling me that you sort of thought of Germany as having no strategy, as it's just kind of existing and trying to figure out what's going on. So the thing I would ask you to say a little more about is you said that the United States and Germany are on a collision course. I definitely think there are some divergent interests there, but I wouldn't quite have used that strong a terminology. So I wonder what you mean when you say that they're on a collision course. And I wonder also if you could explain to our listeners what you mean when you say that as an Italian, looking at what Germany is doing in the Eurozone, it doesn't look like Germany actually has that much of a strategy. Germany and the U.S. are on a collision course because the U.S. looks at the European Union, especially the Eurozone, the whole European construction, and believes that it's working, as you said, just for Germany. And Germany is, a, um, is too important just to be an economical power forever. So the U.S. looks at Germany and says, okay, there are, even because of the U.S., because the U.S. at, at first, they devised the European uh, integration decades ago. And the U.S. even tolerated or sponsored to some extent the creation of, of the common currency. So, but now the Americans look at the European construction and they, they see it as if too beneficial to Germany. Um, and only to Germany, and uh, something li like a platform that Germany someday could use for geopolitical uh, goals. Nowadays, Germany doesn't have a geopolitical strategy. They just have an economical strategy. They look at experts. They want experts. They want to live off experts. Why? Because they need a trade surplus going forward. They think they're going to use that trade surplus to pay for their welfare state, uh, something that they, were, that they might be able to do, I don't know, in 20 30 or 40 years from now. That's not a strategy, or at least not a geopolitical strategy as we as we think of a strategy. To Americans, it, in geopolitics overall, I'd say, things can change really quick. So tomorrow, uh, Germany might develop a strategy and use that platform to its own benefit, and might even use it to get closer to Russia. Of course, that's another obsession, American obsession. Of course, Germany and Russia getting together, uh, being complementary, just because... As, you, as we know, Germany's got technology and a social discipline. On the other hand, you have a country that has, of course, hydrocarbons, natural resources, and uh, military prowess. So together, they could, be, they could really be a superpower, even though they're, they're both old. But uh, that's, that's, another, that's another part of it. So those are the reasons why, to us, uh, Germany and the U.S. are on a collision course. And where uh, Italy fits in, into, into, this, into this scenario. As I said, Italy is trying f to uh, kind of force Germany to rethink the whole European construction, especially redistributed wealth. That's something that really interests Italy at this point. And uh, um, being Germany on a collision course with the U.S. could, of course, benefit Italy, especially if Italy... Um, knows how to choose, how to pick the ally at this point. But Italy's got an, another, prob another problem here. Northern Italy is part of the value chain of Germany. It's basically just integrated into it. Then you have Southern Italy, which is not. So what would happen if Germany one day creates its own currency, the Northern currency, so to speak, in Euro? Northern Italy would like to be part of it, but Southern Italy would not. And even more importantly, the U.S. would probably oppose such currency because that currency would, be, would belong to Germany and its satellites. So Germany, in the end, would have crafted its own sphere of influence in the heart of Europe, something that, of course, the Americans would never tolerate. Let's remember that the Americans fought two world wars just because Europe could not be dominated, especially by Germany, and even fought, so to speak, another Cold War because that that point, the Soviet Union, but even Germany to some extent, couldn't be together or 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 just become partners to dominate the Euro the Eurasian mass, if you want to call it that way. So Italy at that point would choose would pick an ally, possibly would pick the U.S. at that point, just because we depend on the U.S. for our own security. We're part of NATO, and Germany, as I said, being part of a construction dominated by Germany doesn't work for us. Well, let's talk then about the elephant in the room, though, which is France, because you mentioned France a little bit, and France is, is probably the country we would say that is spearheading the move towards reforming the European Union on a solid basis. And I would say that 
you know, at GPF and in my own writing, uh, we have been perhaps too dismissive of France. Um, we look at France and we see a country that really doesn't have the level of, of social discipline that you're talking about to make major changes. We look at the last elections, and it seems to me that if uh, Marie Le Pen's name had been anything other than Le Pen, that she might have really had a chance to ascend maybe to the presidency. Um, I think the sort of the historical memory of her father really prevented her from surging forward in the polls and let Macron come into office. Um, at the same time, though, when you look at Europe, you see that France has one of the largest economies in the continent. Uh, it certainly has the most powerful military on the continent. If you're just thinking about you know, pure, raw military power, France has that. In terms of political influence, both in Europe and throughout the world, France certainly has a lot more of that uh, than perhaps any other country besides the United Kingdom. And we know the United Kingdom is, has a complicated relationship now with the rest of Europe. We talked about how Italy is looking to the United States to push back against Germany and figure out its place in Europe. Where does France fit here? Because, as you said, you know, the United States fought World War I and World War II about the German question, while France has been fighting decades even longer than that about the German question. Yeah, that's complicated. Let's say that France, unlike many countries around, uh, around Europe, has been cultivating Jubilee dimensions that, for example, Italy or even Germany, or even UK to some extent, have not. Beyond the whole European rhetoric, uh, France has been pursuing uh, its own geopolitical uh, goals, especially, especially at home. They still have a nuclear arsenal that they, of course, they didn't want to dismiss. Uh, they, they've been pursuing their own demographics. France is basically the only country in Europe that's been growing, that's been growing uh, demographically. And, of course, they need to assimilate especially the, the, the sons and grandchildren, the sons and daughters and grandchildren of the immigrants, which, of course, is no, is no easy task. But uh, that's what they've been doing. So today, France cannot, uh, cannot abandon uh, Germany. They need to be attached to Germany. Otherwise, the financial markets would punish France, almost, like, almost to the same extent that they, they'd punish Italy for the same reason. So today, they need to be attached to, to, to Germany, that's basically Macron's bet. Uh, Macron says, today we need to stay with Germany. So let's rethink the whole European construction, which to, our, to a Frenchman means, let's rethink Europe as a platform for France's influence around the world. Nothing shorter than that. Because um, today we need to be with Germany. But if you consider that um, maybe even before uh, 2050, France might or will surpass Germany's population. That's something really important for France. And um, by the end of the century, France might have the same population of European Russia, around 90 million people. That's the extent of France's power. And that's something that they've been working on for decades, that they have abandoned, even in this post-historical kind of time that, that West European powers or countries have been living in, uh, especially since World War II. So France might be bound to dominate the continent or even to face Russia to dominate what, re what remains of the continent at that point by the end of the century. Nowadays, they're just trying to stay, uh, to stay uh, attached, to stay with, the, with Germany for that reason. France has been trying to rethink Europe to its own benefit, and whenever it tries it does that by uh, trying to get Italy into its own thinking, to, to at least to have a coherent front against Germany. But to France, the real goal, the real game is going forward by, by, by the half of the century, even by the end of the century. Yeah, and I, I just want to note that in, when I'm listening to Dario talk, it's, it's a pleasure to talk to him for me because even though we may disagree on a few things, I think we might disagree maybe on the long-term fundamentals of French power. Um, I still feel a sort of kinship with you because we both aren't looking at the ideology and the politics and all this other stuff on top of it. We are talking about interests and about, yes, when you think about France, you have to think about France using the European Union as a platform for French power not as some sort of moment where all Europeans come together and sing Kumbaya and do whatever they want. So I just wanted to, I, that struck me while you were talking. But the other thing that struck me while you were talking... You see, I'm sorry to interrupt you, you see France having more problems than uh, strong points at this point? Well, you, you've given me something to think about because I, I would have been fairly dismissive about the potential of French power inside of Europe. And also, that is also a reflection of how I see Europe being increasingly more fractured. 
I'm not sure that France could be powerful enough relative to whatever factions would come up in Europe for France to really achieve a dominant position, even if France could get its own house in order to want to project that kind of political and economic power. Um, but your demographic argument is, is very strong. As I said, they need to assimilate, not integrate. They can integrate. European countries tend to integrate their immigrants, which means having them accept the code of customs, um, civic norms, human language. To assimilate someone is really different. It means that he has to become part of the population, part of the ethnic group, if, if it ever exists at one. Uh, why? Because countries that tend to assimilate, they think that in the future they might need to go to war. They might need to wage war to some other power. And if you need to go to war, do you have to assimilate those immigrants? Because you have to be sure that they look at the world just the way that you do. But there's only one dominant cultural model in the country. You can have a multi-ethnic country, but not a multicultural country if you want to pursue the status of a great power around the world. Otherwise, if you, wanna, if you need to go to war and you're not sure that your neighbor looks at the world just the way you do, you don't sleep at night, and, and even more, even more uh, for sure, you're not going to war with them or with her. So France needs to overcome that obstacle, that problem that it does have going forward. But uh, that's the reason why uh, France, I mean, demographics, that's the reason why France has got a bright future ahead of it. Well, and it's, it's a particularly acute problem for France because France has a large Arab population and a large Muslim population. And the last time I looked at French demographics, I was struck by the fact that the French take secularism so seriously that they don't even count Muslims in their census. So France doesn't even have itself an idea of the scale of the problem. Doesn't even know. So if you're thinking, and you know, the, the flip side of this, of course, is that France's version of integration is very much, you know, will take you, but you have to leave everything at the door. And considering how hard it is to become a part of the French nation, that's very difficult. But that does bring up another point, which is we're sort of thinking about Europe right now almost as a self-contained entity. We, you know, we mentioned Russia a little bit, but Russia is really, I would call it a declining power probably. We may see it become more aggressive because of that declining power, but ultimately the fundamentals of its power are decreasing. But when you start talking about Muslims in Europe, you have to start talking about the major rising power that is right on Europe's do doorstep, and that is Turkey. And as somebody who is in Italy and who is sitting on the Mediterranean and is looking towards the Bosporus and sees Turkish power, I wonder if we might say that the rise of Turkey might be the thing that unites Europe at the end. Perhaps, you know, already in Eastern Europe, countries are beginning to look at Turkey a little more skeptically. We have seen Germany and Turkey clash rhetorically over time. And there has been a pattern throughout history of when Europe bands together is usually when it has some kind of common foe. So the European Union and all these institutions we think of right now, the common foe was the Soviet Union. But if you go back in history, 400, 500 years, the common foe was always the Ottoman Empire, was always Turkish power, Muslim power coming up through Southern Europe and trying to assert itself in the European continent. I think you, you and I both think that Turkey is strengthening and has those kinds of ambitions on the continent. Do you think that Turkey will be strong enough to create that kind of uniting of different political factions in Europe that is just completely unimaginable now? Now it is unimaginable. Um, maybe in 20, 30, 40 years, it might. In 20 years especially, when Turkey, I believe, it will be a major, major power by that time. And uh, definitely um, could have the power, of course, that might sound counterintuitive, but uh, could have the power to, to unify Europeans against that. But it all depends on what Europe will be in 20, 20 years or even 30 years by that time. For example, Germany that doesn't want to be an empire, uh, doesn't have the mindset of an empire, it, it exports. An uh, empire tends to import as many goods as he, as he can. And even more importantly, Germany doesn't have a soft power. An empire without a soft power doesn't exist. You need to convince the satellites that they're, they're better off with you than, with, than without you. But Germany, if, if it's looking for something related, relating to a soft power, I use Turkey to, to, that, to that extent, um, even more so to convince those countries that are part of its value chain, for example, uh, Eastern European, Central and Eastern European countries, they all depend on 
uh, Germany for their own economy, but they tend not to follow Germany on anything that is geopolitical, just because Germany doesn't have a strategy, as we said. So they tend to depend on it, but they tend to look at the U.S., for example, for their own uh, geopolitical needs, so to speak, especially vis-a-vis -vis Russia. Germany might use Turkey, might say, Turkey is the real enemy. Uh, let's look at Turkey. Let's stick with us, the Germans, because we're in this together. But as I said, uh, it'll be in 20 years, I think, not today. Even though nowadays Germany and even all of its satellites, they, they already have an all-star relationship with Turkey, um, especially towards Erdogan. People tend to overestimate, as we both know, leaders. They tend to think that the problem is Erdogan here, that if you get rid of him, Turkey will go back to being, I don't know, the demiled power that, that, that was, I don't know, 20 years ago. Uh, the real reason here, uh, as we both know, is structural. Uh, Turkish masses, especially those from central Turkey, they, they, they've gotten rid of the inferiority complex that they had towards the West. They're, they're conservative, they're rural, they're religious, they want an empire. They at least they want to go back to what Turkey was um, some centuries ago or even some decades ago, a powerful, respected empire. So Erdogan is not a problem. It's just the litter that has, that has been able enough to exploit to his, to, to his own benefit what's going on in Turkey. But yes, Europe might use it to, to its own benefit to unify itself. But in 20, 30 years, we actually honestly don't know what Europe will, will look like in 20 years. Well, I'll get you out of here on this question then. What does Europe look like in 20 or 30 years? I know that I know that you can't know for sure, but you know, in, sort of your, in your opinion, are we talking about the European Union in 20 or 30 years? Do you think that the reforms that will make Brussels more powerful will succeed? Do you think that we'll see the European Union maybe become just a free trade zone? Where do you see the European Union in 20, 30 years? I think it, it depends on the U.S. I think we tend to uh, underestimate what the U.S. Uh, did or has done, whatever you want to say, towards Europe. The U.S. basically invented the European integration after World War II. The Americans uh, literally forced uh, the Germans and the French to make the integration. They didn't want to hear about it. Let's remember that he had fought three wars in 70 years back then. Two of them were world wars, of course. The U.S., for, of course, for the entire Cold War, thought that the Western, Western Europe was un a unified Western Europe would be uh, beneficial to its own interests, first and foremost, because when you need to, con to control a space, you would like for that space to be unified. That becomes uh, much easier, of course, if you, if you had that goal. Then the U.S. wanted the whole Europe to, to unify, so to speak. Uh, of course, uh, then again, especially in the, in the 1990s, vis-a-vis uh, -vis Russia. Russia that back then was, of course, ailing, but the, the Americans knew that uh, uh, somewhere along the road, uh, Russia, even if the decline powers, as you said, might, might anyway uh, rise again from, from its own ashes. Uh, Nowadays, America's approach towards Europe has changed. Um, to me, uh, one of the reasons is Germany, as I said before, because they now understand that this Europe, this way, is too beneficial to Germany. Uh, it uh, indifferently pursues Germany's interests. So they would like to have it weakened because they would weaken Germany to some extent going forward. The other reason why is Sometimes we tend to overlook um, this reason that the U.S. doesn't look at Russia as a powerful enemy as we might think it does. Otherwise, we need a unified front to confront Russia. Russia nowadays is such a small power, so to speak, for the U.S., that Easter, a unified Eastern Europe, unified against Russia, I mean, uh, is already uh, enough to confront Russia. You don't need a unified continent. You can even spare your time, the U.S. can, to try to, uh, uh, to break the integration, if you consider that integration too beneficial to Germany. So in the future, I think it, it will depend on, on the U.S. If another enemy arises at the horizon for the U.S., then the Americans might need Europe to, to get unified again, to confront it, or even more uh, likely to me, we could see going forward Europe kind of regrouping uh, around uh, 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 groups of countries, Germany's sphere of influence, 
economical experimental influence. Uh, Western Europe, Latin Europe to some extent, the UK on the other on the other hand, even in Scandinavia for for that reason. I think that we we could yeah Brussels will still be there, uh, formerly European Union will still be there, but uh, groups of different countries uh, would would make up what Europe uh, will look like in the future. Yeah, and I think your your point is so important. Not it's not just about the European Union. It's about NATO. It's about any kind of large multinational bureaucracy, right? Because it's, it's jarring at times to see the G7 fight amongst itself so much, and it's jarring to see the European Union having such intense disagreements, and it's jarring to see that you know, a NATO member, Turkey, is doing one thing inside of Syria that other NATO members want nothing to do with. And I think the thing that we have to remember here is that these institutions were created for a particular purpose, a particular reason, most of them to combat the Soviet Union. And now that the Soviet Union is gone, and now that the world has had 20 or 30 years to realize that the Soviet Union is gone, and other countries have developed alongside it, you have new challenges. So it makes sense that some of these bureaucracies, which is the hardest thing to change, because when you're a, when you're a bureaucrat, you, you want to make sure you get your check and that you go home for dinner and everything's fine. But one of the ways to read all these changes in the institutions at top is just to say that the power dynamics are all shifting here. And exactly what you said, it may not be the end of the European Union. It just might be the end of the European Union as we know it today. It will have to rearrange itself if it's going to be relevant in a world where the major issue is not how to stop the Soviet Union, but the major issues are how to make sure Germany doesn't repeat history, how to make sure Turkish power doesn't come onto the European continent, how to make sure France doesn't repeat history. We shouldn't forget that the French have imperial ambitions of their own. Um, Dara, anything else you want to add before we say goodbye to our listeners? I'd say that, uh, yeah, Brussels will still be there in 20 years, but uh, please let's try to focus on, on the countries around Europe because for many, many years we've been told that uh, nation states were, in, were, were no longer there, that were no longer important because other uh, entities would arise just uh, to take their own place. And uh, we just learned, of course, we knew that all along, but uh, people just learned uh, that uh, nation states are still important, empires and nation states, I'd say. And that's something that even in the future, I think, will accompany us with, with our own analysis. All right. Well, thank you, Dario. Thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you for having me. And uh, listeners, thank you so much, as always, for listening to our podcast. You can find more material at www.geopoliticalfutures.com. For the Italian readers and listeners out there, you can also check out Limes online um, to view some of Dario's. Sure, you should. You should. You should. <laughs> I can't read the Italian, but I've been told it's very good. So, all right. Thank you, guys.